Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundant. And uh, as if it wasn't enough that he would give us life, but he gives us life more abundant. He said like a wellspring springing up within us unto, ever, unto uh, eternal life. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 1, if you would please, this morning. Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> for those that have been visiting, uh, for those that are visiting with us this morning, uh, we have been in a series on Sunday mornings for a significant amount of time now. I don't even know how many uh, weeks of looking for Jesus in every book of the Bible. And of course, when we get to, when we turn the corner out of the Old Testament into the New Testament, that gets a lot easier to do. Not that it was real difficult to do before that, but it gets a lot easier uh, when you get into the Gospels. And, uh, and we're in uh, Luke now. And so with, through the Gospels, we're doing something just a little bit different. Instead of finding Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, which is very easy to do, uh, we're finding about how Jesus, the Jesus of Luke, fulfilled a lot of those Old Testament promises and things that we looked at when we were coming through the Old Testament. And this morning, I want us to look in Luke chapter 1. And uh, verse number 46 is where we're going to start. Now, when we start reading here, um, I'm going to just say this in introduction and then move on, that the Roman Catholics have hijacked, unfortunately, and somewhat perverted just about anything that the Bible says about Mary in the Bible. It's an incredibly unfortunate thing because the Catholics seek to make her uh, more than she was and try to make her a mediator or a way to God or a way to Jesus or, or something like that, and that's just simply not accurate. But to the other extreme, when the pendulum swings the other way, there are some who, in opposition to Roman Catholicism, basically make her less than what she is. So who is she? Well, she's a girl. She's a young lady in this passage. That's exactly who she is. But let's not forget that even God himself said that she was highly favored and that she was blessed by God. And so we're not going to act like, well, nothing significant about Mary. Are you kidding me? There's nothing significant about the, the woman that God chose to bring the Christ into the world. Of course there is. Of course that's blessed. Of course that's uh, worthy of honor and significance there. But she's not a mediator. She's not a savior. She's not the savior. Uh, she needed a savior. She had to trust in her own son for salvation. And so when she is told that she's going to be bearing the Christ child and that the, the child that is in her womb is there, conceived of the Holy Ghost, then there were some issues. It was not without problems. It was not without difficulties. She was espoused to a man that she was to be married to. But this did not look good because she had not, uh, she had not known a man, but all of a sudden she's pregnant. Now, everybody else in the world is going to say, yeah, right. And so even uh, Joseph himself thought to put her away privately because of her being with child. But an angel came to him and reassured him that that which was in Mary was of the Holy Ghost. And that this was God doing a miraculous thing in fulfillment of his promises to uh, the fathers of Israel and to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and so she goes away for a while. She goes to visit her cousin, uh, Elizabeth, who is also with child. And the child that she has in her womb is going to come to be known as John the Baptist. And when Mary walks into the room and speaks to Elizabeth, then John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy that the Christ is there. Now we know this because the Bible tells us this. 
And, uh, and so then the Holy Spirit comes upon Elizabeth and what she says under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, first word she said is blessed or blessed. She said, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now this is in verse 42, if you wanted to follow along there. Verse 43, And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And now Mary responds to what Elizabeth has just said. This is exciting. Mary says in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations... Uh, from, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath opened his servant. That word hoping is not one that usually appears in our daily vocabulary, but it simply means this, he has supported or helped. Uh, he has supported or helped. He has hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning, and I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord. Thank you. For giving us your word, thank you for this wonderful revelation. And help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verses 46 through 55 are, if you were to Google this or look this up, it would be called the Magnificat. And once again, that's a, primarily a Catholic terminology as it was turned into a song or a hymn to be sung in the Catholic Church, but I got to tell you, we would sing that song in our church because it comes right out of the Scripture, and it's Mary's praise to the Lord. Now, what they might mean when they sing it might be different than what we would mean when we sing it because we believe that Mary is magnifying, rejoicing in, glorifying the Lord because the Lord is worthy of being magnified. He's worthy of being praised. He's worthy of being glorified. But what's interesting to me is Elizabeth looks at her and by the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth says, you are blessed. And here's what Mary does with that. I love this. She takes that blessing and she directs it right to the source of all blessing. Oh, that we would do that as Christians. When some praise comes our way, if we could just remember every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, and we would just, we would just glance that praise right off of us. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you let it land here, it's going to hurt you. If you let it land here, it, it, it has a tendency to cause swelling in the head. And that's not good for anybody. But when praise comes our direction for some good or for some blessing, if we can just say, my soul doth magnify the Lord. I, I want to give God the credit for this. I want to give God the praise for this. because of Not because of what I'm doing, but because of what God is doing. That's the big picture that's going on here. Now Mary's saying, I just get to be a part. And don't get me wrong, she's saying, I'm honored to play the part that God has chosen for me. But the bigger picture is God is doing what He promised. As a matter of fact, 
her reflection of the fulfillment of God's promises back to God is really profound when you realize that in 10 verses, what we have here in 10 verses of Mary's anthem or her praise or her song, watch this, this is good. In 10 verses, there are at least 23 references to the promises of the Old Testament. 23 references packed into 10 verses of what comes out of Mary's mouth because what's she doing? She's indicating that the covenant God is still faithful. The covenant God is still true to His Word. The covenant God who made a, who made a covenant with Abraham and His seed is still fulfilling His covenant. And so she says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Um, even those words are reflective of, of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. As a matter of fact, there's a song that a lady in the Old Testament named Hannah sings to the Lord when God gave her a child. And Mary took a page right out of Hannah's songbook and even duplicated some of the language in Hannah's song, there's at least five references to the praise that Hannah gave God for Samuel, her child, that Mary repeats here, tying this back into Old Testament praise to a covenant faithful God. And then she says this, For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations, now listen to this, shall call me blessed. That is a direct reference to a promise God made. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm, I'm going to bless thee, and in thee all the nations of the earth will be blessed, and they will call you a blessing. Abraham. That's what's going to happen. And so now when Mary realizes what God is doing in her physical body, she says, look, here's what's happening here. This sounds kind of arrogant. I'll be honest. When I first read this, I thought that's kind of arrogant. She says, uh, behold, <clears throat> from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Now see, if you, if you get the right tone in there, well, you can make that sound real arrogant. Tone can make anything sound arrogant. That's why I don't like text messages. Because I don't have tone. You know, my wife reads a text message to me and she's adding tone. And I said, well, what if, they say, what if they wrote that with a completely different tone? They might be cursing you right now. And, and, but my wife reads every... Uh, a text message like it's chipper and full of exclamation points and everything like that. And I'm like, hey, look at the emojis. <laughs> that, that'll give you a clue. It'll give you a clue. I, look, I, I believe in tone. So most of my texts are emojis. Because if I don't get the words across, I want them to get my tone. <laughs> it's that important. But, but she's not saying it like, <clears throat> from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. You know what she's doing? She's claiming an Old Testament promise. She's saying, do you realize that God made that covenant with Abraham and his seed? She says that at the end of the song. Do you know why that's significant right here? It's significant because Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, he, he did not say as unto seeds which are many. He's not talking about when he says unto Abraham and his seed, he's not making a covenant with Abraham and all of the descendants of Abraham. He's promising a covenant with Abraham and his seed which is one, which is Christ. And Mary's realizing that that covenant seed 
is right here. That covenant seed is in my womb. The reason that all generations shall call me blessed is because in Genesis 12, God said that they would call Abraham blessed. And the promise to Abraham is now in my womb. That's why I'm blessed. She's she's saying, I'm not blessed because I'm somebody, but I'm blessed because I'm carrying somebody. I'm not blessed because of who I am. I'm blessed because of what God has enabled me to do in the grand picture of the salvation of the world. And then she says this. She says, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things. And holy is his name. Church, we forget that sometimes. We forget how holy God is. When when critics and blasphemers and naysayers start talking about Mary's conception as though... uh, as the story goes in the Mormon faith that Elohim came down and and sexually reproduced uh, with Mary or, or or something like that, I'm just going to tell you that's sick, that's perverted, that is below the holiness of God. What God did with Mary was honorable. What God did with Mary was above reproach. What God did with Mary was spiritual. It was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. It wasn't a physical thing. And though he became a physical man, that conception was not carried out by a physical act. That's perverted. And, and Mary just sets the record straight by, said, by saying that he that is mighty hath done to me great things and holy is his name. He's upright. He's set apart from his creation and ought not be pulled down to be made like unto his creation. Church, I want to encourage us this morning. Don't forget that God is God. He's not a man like you and I. He's not the man upstairs. He's not, to be, he's not to be viewed uh, flippantly or lightly, but there is still something called the fear of the Lord. A combination of, of uh, fright and reverence at who He really is. The true and living God of the Bible is not a creature. He is the Creator, which sets Him above all of creation. He doesn't think like we think. He doesn't act like we act. He doesn't behave like we behave. He's altogether holy. In verse 50, now we come into another stanza of the psalm. And Mary doesn't speak from uh, as much of a personal uh, testimony anymore of what God's doing with her, but what God's doing on the whole, for the world. Because of what is about to come about through her, in verse 51, He has showed strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Now, these next few verses, they could have a direct correlation to Mary because the truth is, we don't know what Mary began to face when people around her started realizing that she was with child and not yet married to Joseph. What we do know is this. We do know the environment that she's in. We know how the religious leaders would have treated this in her day. They would have wanted her stoned. They would have wanted the fulfillment of the Pharisaical Old Testament law. Well, she's obviously guilty, and so uh, she needs to be uh, she needs to be punished for this action. And that might have been the very reason that that Joseph uh, had her go away for a while and spend the time at Elizabeth's house. But Mary had realized this that in verse number fifty. 
His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent away empty. Now this is very common terminology from the Old Testament, Testament away in declaring that the coming kingdom of the Messiah would be backwards from what earthly kingdoms look like. Sure enough, 30 years later from this time right now, Jesus is going to start his public ministry teaching. And you know what he's going to teach his disciples about that coming kingdom? He's going to teach them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that do mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Mary is perpetuating in this song already the reverse nature of the character of God over man. And God doesn't look at things like man looks at things. But one thing I want to point out in verse number 50 that I'm happy to tell you about is that when we looked at Matthew a few weeks ago and we saw where Matthew pointed uh, the Jews to their Messiah and all of Matthew's references about Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the, the genealogy goes back to Abraham. Everything was specific to the Jews. But when Luke writes about the Savior, he doesn't limit it to the Jews. When Luke writes about the Savior, he includes all men. That Jesus is a Savior who has come from generation to generation for all who fear Him. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 3, when Luke gives the genealogy, he blows right through Abraham and goes all the way back to Adam to show that the Son of Man did not just come for the Jewish people, but he came for Adam's race. That's all of us. I think that might be important to the only Gentile writer of the Bible with the exception possibly of Job. The only Gentile writer might consider it very important that this Savior didn't just come for the Jewish people, but He came for all men. He came for all men. And then we get down into verse number 54. He hath hoping His servant Israel. Now, I'm just going to challenge you. Somebody needs to use that word tomorrow. Okay? Uh, go to work, school, your daily life. Just throw the word hoping out there and let's get it going again. It's too good of a word to lose it in the English language. So let's just bring it back. Okay. And, uh, it, you know, let me just say, uh, well, uh, you know, you're a teacher. You're at school tomorrow. You got final projects being turned in and you can just say, well, uh, it's a good job. But it looks like your parents did hoping you in that. I don't think you did that on your own. The truth is, God has always supported Israel. It's a fact. I'll help you with some truth this morning. God still is hoping Israel. He is. He helps Israel. You say, why? He's got a covenant relationship with him. You say, well, they broke the covenant many times. But God doesn't break his. He's faithful. He's got promises to fulfill. Israel is still a nation today. Why? Because they have been hoping by God. And they still will be. Well, you're not supposed to make political statements from the pulpit. You take this for whatever you want, but our country better stay allies with Israel. We better stay friends of Israel. Because Israel is God's people, and to turn against Israel is to turn against God. But when she says that they have been supported by God, she's not talking about necessarily just 
stayed alive. You know, the truth is Romans 9 says that Israel stayed alive because God had promises to fulfill to the rest of the world. Promises that Israel didn't even claim. Promises that Israel didn't even get by the time you get to Romans uh, chapter 10. Uh, but who hath believed our report? But God had promises and so he helped Israel. He kept a remnant. He brought them back from captivity. He established them again in their land. He allowed for the rebuilding of a temple and the reinstitution of his worship again. And then he went silent for 400 years until one day an angel appears unto Zacharias. And then Mary, and then Joseph. And then things are still kind of quiet until the first prophet since Malachi shows up out in the desert wearing camel hair, eating locusts and wild honey, and like a wild man saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the forerunner was on the scene to one day point his finger and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. God has helped Israel for this reason. He remembers. He remembers his mercy. He remembers the promises of salvation. He remembers the promises of hope that he gave to his people, the ones that he spoke to the fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed, singular, forever. Because, see, up until this time, get this, up until this time, the hope of all has been in the promise given to Abraham. But now the promise is in the flesh. Now I'm, I'm going to stop and say something right here and you might think it's off topic. I don't believe it is. But when I say that right now in this moment the promise is in the flesh is because Jesus was already in Mary's womb. That means Jesus was already in the flesh in the womb. He didn't need to be born to be in the flesh. He was in the flesh in the womb. Let's just talk reality here for a second. Life begins in the womb. The promise of God was fulfilled when Mary conceived by the Holy Ghost the promised child. That child existed in the flesh from that moment of conception. The other child that was in Elizabeth's womb is already hearing voices and leaping up and down. Sounds like life to me. I know where we are politically right now. I know about the leak from the Supreme Court. I'm just going to tell you nothing leaks by accident in our government. And I know, I even saw an article in the paper yesterday that, that uh, people were encouraged to uh, plant themselves in evangelical churches today to protest the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I hope nobody's here uh, for that purpose this morning. I hope you came to worship and, and, and serve the Lord and hear the truth of His Word. And that's all I'm doing is telling the truth of His Word. That, that law was never constitutional in the first place and does need to be overturned. But more than that, more than the overturning of a law, there needs to be repentance from the United States of America of the millions of babies that have lost their life for other people's convenience. And there might be somebody in here this morning who's had an abortion. And let me just say, God forgives. God's grace is greater than all of our sin. 
And where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. But abortion is murder, and murder is wrong. And it is sin. And there needs to be repentance of that so that God can forgive and so that God can heal. Because God's value of life is greater than you and I can understand. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but in the difficult days of finding out that she was with child and not married, I'm glad that Mary didn't run down to a clinic. You say, well, God wouldn't have let that happen. I'm just saying it ought to at least be a thought in our minds. I'm glad there was somebody here that said, we're having this baby. And let me just tell you, you don't need, a, you don't need an angel to appear in the night to tell you that that baby that's in your womb is worth something. Because <laughs> it is. You say, well, people look down upon me for how it got there. And there's always consequences for sin. Make no mistake about that. But that child has value. That child has value to God. That ha child has value to humanity. That child uh, has, has a plan already established by God for it. Have that baby and see what God can do. Mary is in full realization here that what's taken place in her is a fulfillment of God's promise to bring this about. The greatest promise that God ever gave was that we could be forgiven of our sins and have salvation. But there's only one way, ladies and gentlemen, that that could ever happen. And that required a sacrifice beyond what you and I on our own could ever offer. If you think about this for a second this morning, there are many religions of the world that demand sacrifice as part of their worship. But in all of those religions, it is the God, the deity, that demands sacrifice from its followers. But only in Christianity is there a God who sacrificed himself for his followers. Because there's only one true and living God and this God loves humanity so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, preacher, what do I need to be for, what do I need to do to be forgiven of my sins? What do I need to do to be saved? Look, there's nothing you can do to be saved. There is nothing that you can offer to God that you have that he requires or that he's looking for for you to be forgiven of your sin and saved. The only thing that he asks of you is to accept the sacrifice that that has already been made on your behalf. Because the Bible says this. To wit, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. To wit, God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's what God was doing when Jesus died upon the cross, when he was buried in a borrowed tomb, when he rose again the third day. Uh, what God was doing was God was reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ. You say, preacher, does that then mean that the whole world is saved? The whole world is forgiven? The whole world is reconciled to God? Well, if that was the case, he wouldn't have gone on in the same passage to tell the church at Corinth, now then are we ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Somebody goes, well, you just said that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. I know, but if you never accept Christ, you don't have that reconciliation. If you don't seek reconciliation, then there's none available. But everyone who trusts in Christ can know a life that is reconciled to God. Can know what it is to be spiritually made alive again. And not just made alive, but to have abundant life. i got to tell you, when I got saved, when the Lord forgave me of my sin, I cannot explain the peace that passes all understanding. I can't explain to you the joy unspeakable and full of glory. I can't explain to you what it's like uh, to uh, fully, I can't explain to get up in the morning and know my life has purpose today. My life has meaning today because I am to live for the glory of the one who died for me and lives again and one day I'm going to see him face to face. And as Mary realizes that people are calling her blessed, she doesn't say, no, don't do that because she realizes she is Look, if you call me a blessed person, I'm not going to say, no, don't call me blessed. You know why? Because I am a blessed person. And think about this. The reason I'm blessed is the same reason Mary said she was blessed. Well, preacher, why did she say that she was blessed? Now listen to this. Because Christ was in her. You know why I'm blessed this morning? Amen. Yes. Because Christ is in me. Amen. 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 Well, preacher, you don't even have a womb. <laughs> no, I don't mind telling you, I am biologically and in every other way male. I uh, heard a woman this week say, I have a womb, but I'm not female. And that's the messed up, very confused society that we live in today. No, I don't need a womb for Jesus to live in me. But Paul wrote to the Colossians and he said this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And as a five-year-old boy, when I realized I was a sinner and I needed a savior, I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross and rose again to be a living Savior. And I called upon Him and I asked Him to forgive me of my sin and save you. And I'm telling you, He moved in. He came to live within my heart. And He walks with me and He talks with me. A, lot, a long life's narrow way. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. And I am blessed today because Jesus lives in me. And if Jesus lives in you today, you're blessed. You say, preacher, look at my life. It doesn't look like much. Hey, God condescends to men of low estate and He lifts them up. It's not about what your life looks like. It's about who you've trusted in. And it's about who who loves you and what He has done for you. I'm telling you, we're blessed not because of our circumstances. We're blessed because we have a Savior who is our Savior forevermore. Thank God for Jesus. So when somebody looks at me and says, you're blessed. You know what my response needs to be? I just want to magnify the Lord. If you see blessing in me, it's only because of Him. If you see God defend me, it's only because He lives in me. If you see God provide for me, it's because He promised me He would. If you see God protect me, it's because He said that He would do so. Every blessing that I have in this life is because of Jesus and because of the fact that He lives in me. And if He doesn't live in you today, He wants to. 
Oh, He wants to come in. He wants to be part of your life. He wants to be your Savior. He wants to, he wants to cleanse the guilt from your conscience of the sin that has defiled it. He wants to forgive you of all sin, past, present, and future. He wants to reconcile you to a righteous, holy God. And He wants to live with you, walk with you, and share every experience of life with you moment by moment, day by day, as we live trusting Jesus. It's hard sometimes. It's difficult. God, why am I in pain? You want to know the answer to that? Pain's part of life. We're all going to hurt sometimes. We're all going to be in pain sometimes. God, why am I grieving so deeply? Because grief and loss are part of life. And we're all going to experience that. And what a lot of people end up doing is saying, God, if you love me, why am I hurting? God, if you love me, uh, why am I grieving? God, if you love me. And if we're not careful, we start looking to our experiences to find out whether or not God loves us or not. But God didn't demonstrate His love for us. He didn't promise to demonstrate His love for us in our day-to-day experience. But He demonstrated His love for us in that Christ died for us on the cross. And that is something that no one can ever take away from us. Not one circumstance in our life can change that. Does Jesus care? Oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. Well, how do you know? Aren't you going through a difficult time? We all go through difficult times. But I know He loves me because He died on the cross for me. Well, aren't you, haven't you cried night after night after night in grief and the sense of loss? And hasn't your heart been ground into powder? And you might say, yes, that is true. I have cried until there's no more tears to cry, but I know He loves me because Jesus died for me. And that's never going to change. But God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this song of Mary, and God, may it be our song.